Hi friends! Are you guys planning on going to the G3 conference coming up on September 21st until the 23rd? Well, you guys can get a 30% off when you use our discount code G3OPEL. G3OPEL. You can register now by going on the link here in the description. I can't wait to see you guys there. Welcome to Ordinary People with Extraordinary Lives, a podcast dedicated to the testimonies of believers and followers of Jesus Christ. I am your host, Arlene Spucklew. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of Ordinary People with Extraordinary Lives. I am your host, Arlenis. It is always a joy to have you join us on this podcast where we listen to the testimonies of believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Um, if you are new to our podcast, welcome to our podcast. I hope that this podcast is a blessing to you guys as it has been to me. I love sitting here and just listening to the testimonies of so many brothers and sisters that I go to church with or even people that I haven't even met in person. So we met probably through social media. So thank you for listening or watching. And we will love to stay in touch with you guys. So in order to do that, just make sure to follow us on social media. You can find the links here on the description. And if you already follow us on social media, you probably saw some posts that we share because we have some exciting news. Uh, as of 2023, we launched our online store where you can buy our merchandise. And basically, it's merchandise with our logo and some of our favorite Bible verses and some of our favorite quotes also from the podcast. And again, if you want to visit our online store, make sure to check the links here on the description. Friends, and if you would like to have someone to hire someone to help you with sound for a wedding, birthday party, or whatever event you have, make sure to reach out to our dear friend, Andrea Klein. Yes, Andrea is the one that I keep mentioning on the podcast because she is kindly helping us uh, to do the audio for this podcast. But yeah, so if you need anyone to do audio for you, sound for your event, make sure to reach out to Andrea and also just check again the links here in the description. All right, friends, as I do on every episode, we have a new guest. And I think if you listen to uh, Grace to You or GTY, as everyone knows it, right? If you listen to them on the radio or on the podcast, or I think you guys have a podcast. We or, do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So if you heard that voice, <laughs> I think a lot of people recognize that voice already from Grace to You. And if you go to Grace Community Church, you might know him as one of the elders of our church, of Grace Community Church. Church, and he also is one of the pastors for Grace Life Fellowship, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. So if you heard that voice, please help me welcome our dear brother, Phil Johnson. Phil, thank you so much for joining hey, me. Hey, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. I feel like I'm listening to you right now. I, I, know, I, I, <laughs> I am your host, Phil Johnson. I feel like I should say that. Right? <laughs> you know, I was, I was thinking of what to name this episode. And because I always hear you saying, unleashing God's truth. One, one verse at a time. <laughs> yeah. So we're unleashing mayhem, one, one sound bite at a one time. Huh? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> so thank you so much. It's such a joy to have you here. Phil, so uh, normally I like to start, you know, with going back all the way to your childhood, thinking back of where you were born and raised, you know, about your family, where you were raised in a believing home and... Just share as much as you would like. All right. I was born in Oklahoma City, and uh, my grandfathers all were Oklahoma City cattlemen. And uh, my dad was a roofing contractor, and uh, he had served in World War II, and he had become a Christian while he was uh, serving in the Navy in the Philippines. Uh, I have a letter from the pastor who baptized him. And uh, so he and my mom met and married, but they, they got into... Uh, uh, they were all Methodists in their background. And so they got into the Methodist churches, which are just very liberal by the 1950s. And so that's the environment I grew up in, going to Sunday school every week, but it was a liberal church. And I don't recall that I ever heard the gospel, or, or at least heard it presented as the gospel. Mm -hmm. I know we did responsive readings that were from Scripture, and there was gospel truth mixed in, but the sermons kind of undermined it. And, uh, and I began to notice this when I was in junior high. I had a Sunday school teacher who we would go through a New Testament Bible story, usually one of the episodes from Jesus' life or something. Mm -hmm. And if there was a miracle involved, she would always, the Sunday school teacher would always say, 
Now, th this didn't really happen like this. Uh, and, I, and the one that stands out in my mind was when we talked about the man with the withered hand. Mm. And uh, she said, no, nah, Jesus didn't really heal his hand. Uh, mm. And sh she said, what's important about this are the moral lessons. And she went off on this whatever. And, and I was kind of a smart aleck kid, but, but this was a sincere question, too. I said, you know, every week you tell us we shouldn't take this seriously. Why can't I just, why do we have to come here and talk about it? Why can't I stay home and watch the NFL pregame? And she was stymied by that question, uh, but she told the pastor that I had raised the question, and so he got in touch with me and wanted me to come in and have a discussion with him. And he was kind of calling me on the carpet, and he said, you know, she's right that this didn't really happen. She, he said, here's what happened. The man heard Jesus say, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. And so he knew not to take that. Literally, he bound his hand to his side because he had, he had some sin he'd committed with it, thievery or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so he, he uh, resolved not to use his hand anymore. And then Jesus met him and saw that he had bound his hand up and said, no, 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 you loose it and let it go. And that's how he healed the guy's hand. Now, I was just, I don't know, 15 years old or so, and, and this guy had a doctorate in theology. And so I remember listening to that and thinking, all right, that's kind of plausible, but there are lots of miracles in the Bible. Hmm. And, and I couldn't name many of them. Moses parted the Red Sea. He says, of course that didn't happen. He said, water doesn't stand up like walls, and even if it did, the, the land wouldn't be dry enough to walk on. And I said, but... It's a miracle. Isn't that the whole point? This is not stuff that happens in nature. And he says, yeah, nah, you know, there's a story about Elisha who loses an axe head in the water and he makes it float. You know that didn't happen. And Jonah and the whale. He explained the moral lessons supposedly behind all of those miracles. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, even as a young child, I'm th sitting there thinking, this guy doesn't really believe the Bible is true. And so he's not really answering my question. Why should I come to Sunday school and study it? Uh, and, and I remember driving away from that meeting. I was driving by then, so I must have been 16, and thinking, I wish I had asked him about the resurrection of Christ, because mm -hmm. obviously that's the key miracle in Scripture. But I know from what he said, he didn't believe that really happened either. And I also know that if he told the congregation he didn't really believe that, nobody, none of us would come. We'd all stay home and watch the NFL pregame. And so that's what I started to do. Uh, I just quit going to Sunday school. And by then, I, I was old enough, and there were some things going on with my mom's health that kept my parents preoccupied. And, and so they let me just stop going to church for about a year. Mm. I didn't go to church, and I, I just felt this void in my life because I had always had a mentality that God is there, he's watching me, he's holding me accountable, mm -hmm. I'm accountable to somebody. But, but in my mind, I was thinking, if, if I want God to be happy with me, I, I don't have to go to church and hear why the Bible isn't true. Uh, what I have to do is cultivate uh, wisdom and uh, a moral life, basically. Just be good. If I'm good enough, God will accept me, even if I don't go to church. Mm. And then I had a friend who was suddenly converted, who, who had no, never made any pretense of being a Christian, and suddenly he was, a, he was a fanatical Christian and telling everyone about it. And that kind of troubled my conscience, because I thought something really did happen to change him. Mm. And whatever it is, it's nothing I've ever experienced. And, and one night in a in a moment of guilt, I thought, I really should read the Bible for myself because I'd never done that. I, I had a Bible. It was one of those that had a zipper on it, you know, that you yeah. keep it close. And I kept it zipped up so it would stay in pristine condition. I didn't want to wreck it, you know. But I unzipped it and thought, oh, I'll read a little bit. But by that, I meant I'll read a few verses and see. Because I treated the Bible like the horoscope. I'd mm. flop it open and try to find some meaning for me and whatever my eyes lit on. And so I did that. I flopped it open. And it opened to the first page of 1 Corinthians, which is not where you'd send a high school kid to find the gospel, right? Yeah. But, but I thought, okay, that's the first page of... I should read the... I've never read a whole book of the Bible. Maybe I'll read the whole thing. So I counted the pages, and 
It was longer than I hoped it would be, but I thought, I could probably read through this thing tonight. And so I started reading 1 Corinthians. Mm -hmm. And the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians absolutely devastated my worldview, because that's where Paul attacks human wisdom. He says, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with Mm -hmm. God. I was into politics and philosophy and really trying to be wise, and it didn't make any sense to me. I remember thinking, I, I could understand if God said he hated the foolish things of this world, but he hates the wisdom of this world, and if that's the case, I've got no hope. Hmm. And 1 Corinthians 3.18 really stood out to me. It says, if anyone among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. And I thought, I don't, that doesn't... what. Why would God want me to be a fool? What does this mean? And so I just kept reading, and not all of it made sense. 1 Corinthians, again, is a difficult book because Paul's dealing with these problems in the Corinthian church, and not all of it was stuff I understood. But in chapter 12, he starts to talk about how you, how you can discern between the Spirit of Christ and, the, and an evil spirit. And he says, mm-hmm. no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. Mm-hmm. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now again, I had no clue the context of that or any of that, but I understood enough from it to realize this is, this is saying to me that I, I need to submit to the Lordship of Christ. He, he, he was not my Lord. He was more like a buddy or a companion. And suddenly this made sense. And then, not to drag the story out, over that next week, seriously, in just a seven-day span, a bunch of things happened. A guy handed me a gospel track. Nobody had ever given me a track before. And it had a pretty clear description of the way of salvation and the doctrine of justification by faith, which to this day is my favorite soteriological doctrine. And then out of the blue, a guy I barely knew called me up and invited me to an evangelistic crusade. He went to a fundamentalist church, and he had been assigned to invite one friend to this evangelistic crusade. And I think he thought, I'm going to lose whoever, whatever friend I invite. And I was a friend he could afford to lose. So he called me up and invited me to go with this. All he had to do was invite me. He didn't have to bring me. Uh, but to his surprise, I said, yeah, I'd like to go. And so I went, and it was a massive citywide campaign by uh, a well-known preacher who I won't name because he's not totally sound. But that night, he gave a message on the crucifixion of Christ, and his starting place was Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know enough to bring a Bible to this thing, but my friend from the Fundamentalist Church had a Bible. He had it closed on his lap, And when the preacher starts to quote from Isaiah 53, I'm like, okay, I don't know a lot about the Bible, but I know enough to know Isaiah is Old Testament. That that, There can't be the crucifixion of Christ in the book of Isaiah. And so I took his Bible off his lap and looked it up. It took me a while to find it, but I found it. And, uh, you know, from that moment until now, I've never had any doubt about whether the Word of God is is true or not. This is God's Word. 800 years before the time of Christ, predicting in detail the crucifixion. And then this preacher's quoting from Psalm 22 and all these Old Testament verses. And, you know, all of that just sealed in my heart that the Bible is true and Christ is Lord and he needs to be in charge of my life. And it was during that week sometime, I can't tell you the exact moment, but uh, I passed from death unto life and my life's been different ever since. And and just going back uh, a, little, a little bit more with about your dad and everything. So you said that your dad got saved. Yeah. While he was um, serving in the Navy. In the That's Navy, right. Right. Yeah, and they they were in the Methodist Church for a long time, and it wasn't really until uh, until I came to California and was uh, and and they had left the Methodist Church sometime in the in the late 1970s, I think, because okay. the politics of the Methodist Church got very liberal. I mean, it was a lot of communism and stuff even being preached from the pulpit Mm. and so they left and and went through some Arminian churches uh independent churches that had roots in methodism and and i think were confused for a while but then when we came to california they were concerned you know here our son and his wife are coming to california to work with a media ministry you Mm -hmm. know a guy who's a a radio preacher that sounded ominous to them Mm. 
And, um, and that same year that we came, John MacArthur made a series on video called Spiritual Boot Camp. Mm. And uh, I sent them a copy of it. They showed it to the pastor who was their pastor at the time. Now, he was an Arminian, and he wasn't, the, he wasn't the, maybe the most uh, astute theologian, but he knew the gospel. And mm. uh, they showed it to him and said, look at this and tell us if we should be worried about this group that our son and his wife have joined. And the mm. pastor watched the series and he said, it's the best thing I've ever seen. He, they said, would wow. you uh, host a Bible study in your home and work through this series of videos? And so they did. And that set them on a path that ultimately led them away from their Arminianism. Uh, they're both in heaven now, but they went to, uh, first of all, a, a kind of Calvinistic Presbyterian church Mm -hmm. but then uh, ended up in a Reformed Baptist church, which is, which is where they were when, when the Lord took them to heaven. Both of so, your parents. Yeah, both yeah. of my parents. So their, their spiritual journey was, was helped along by mine. I can't take any credit for it because I think when I was a new Christian, I was overly zealous and overly accusatory. And uh, I, I don't think I, I won their hearts with my mm -hmm. style of evangelism, but, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but the Lord drew them anyway back to... Back yeah. to a better church. And are you the were, are you the only child? Did no, I have, have a brother and a sister. Okay. Uh, my sister still they both still live in in uh, Oklahoma. Okay. What once your parents start going to this church, were they involved in any way? How old are you, by the way, at this point? I am. By the time my parents uh, got into uh, what I would consider a truly sound mm -hmm. church, uh, I was probably in my forties by wow. then. So okay. it was. It was maybe 20 years from the time I became a Christian until I was really comfortable that they were in a, a sound yeah. church where they were hearing solid biblical teaching. It really brought their spiritual lives alive. So Yeah. Well, praise God that you got to see that before they went to be with the Lord, right? Yeah. That's a blessing. Now, we all have that before Christ and after Christ. How would you describe Phil Johnson before Christ? And then how will you describe him after Christ? Well, before Christ, I struggled with some of the same sins I struggle with now, you know, mm -hmm. arrogance, pride, you know, the, the idea that uh, even, even I still have to fight the idea that if I'm good, you know, God will like me better. Mm -hmm. I need to be good in order to honor him, not to try to win merit that I don't yeah. deserve, frankly. But uh, my ambitions were from junior high, really, I wanted to be a writer, a newspaper columnist, mm. and uh, write political opinions. And I was into politics in a big way. This was in the late 60s, mm. when students were generally very rebellious. It was the hippie movement, and student politics were very left-leaning. I was a conservative even then. Uh, I was interested in conservative politics, and uh, I used to read and watch on TV, William F. Buckley. He was sort of the model of, mm. you know, who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And I gave that up the minute I became a Christian. Yeah. Uh, and yet, uh, I would say that my, my desire to write and, uh, you know, publish opinion, I suppose. I was going to say criticism. I'm admittedly more critical than some people. <laughs> Uh, it isn't that I enjoy criticism. It's just there's so much to criticize <laughs> in the world today, you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I've I've had opportunities to. I did wrote a blog for 15 years or so that was that was sort of in a way the fulfillment of any desire I ever had to write my opinion. And so <laughs> so uh, it, it's interesting. I think the Lord was preparing me. Uh, even before I was saved, for what I would do afterwards. The remo most remarkable part of m my story, though, I think is that is, is how I came to Grace Church and, and ended up partnering with John MacArthur to edit his books. Uh, the series of events that led to that were so remarkable and providential, and it wasn't anything that I engineered, and yet I look at it and say, it's like the fulfillment of every wish I ever had put me in a place that where I have felt like for all the 40 years that I've been here, I'm, I'm exactly where the Lord made me to be. I'm mm -hmm. doing what God designed me to do, mm -hmm. and I've never had any desire to go anywhere else or do anything else. So now thinking back, because you grew up in Oklahoma, right? Yeah. Uh, you grew up. So what makes you then 
move out here to California? Well, when I first became a Christian, uh, it was a, literally a month before I graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, because my plans changed instantly, I'm, I'm like, I can't study to be a newspaper columnist. I need, first of all, to learn the Bible. And um, so the pastor who baptized me, um, I found within six weeks or so after I was saved, found a little church near my house where there was a pastor. My only criteria, because I had no theological knowledge, my only criteria was I want a church where the pastor opens the Bible and teaches from it. And this guy did. Mm -hmm. And uh, he noticed me as a visitor my first Sunday there. And he caught me before I left the church and uh, asked me what brought me, because I'm a high school kid wearing a suit, you know, and, and I didn't fit. And he, no he noticed. And... Uh, so I said, I'm a, I'm a new Christian, and I told him just briefly, and he said, have you been baptized yet? And I said, no. And he said, well, come tonight, and I'll baptize you. It was just like that. Wow. I said, okay, and I did. Uh, and he said, come to my office. The service starts at 6. Come to my office by 5, because I need to interview you, hear your testimony, and all of that. And, and so I did that. And uh, as part of my testimony, he said, he said, after he heard my testimony, he said, so what are you going to do now? I said, well... I've got to enroll in college, and um, I, I think I need to learn the Bible. Mm. Should I go to a Christian school? And he said, that'd be a good idea. And I said, do you recommend any? And he gave me a list of seven fun, mostly fundamentalist schools. Mm. I, think, I think the first one on his list was Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, which is a really conservative sort of, I think they're probably King James only even, so very conservative schools. But the last school on his list was Moody Bible Institute, and it was the only one on his list that I'd ever heard of. Mm -hmm. I said, is that a good school? Is it Moody Bible Institute? It didn't even sound like a school. It sounded like a, I don't know what, but uh, he said, that's where I graduated from. And I said, fine, that's where I'll go. And so my decision hinged on that, that one moment, and I enrolled at Moody. Uh, they wouldn't take anybody who hadn't been a Christian for at least a year. So I went for a year to a state school in Oklahoma and then transferred to Moody in 1972, graduated from there with my bachelor's degree. And in order to finish my credits to graduate, I had to go to one summer school term at the very end. So I was in Chicago for just six weeks for their summer term, and I was looking for a job, and I couldn't find anybody who would hire somebody for just six weeks. Mm. But Moody Press was desperate for proofreaders, and a friend of mine worked there as a proofreader, gave them my name, and you know they and I didn't really want that job. So I went up for the interview and met with the head editor, and, and I told him, honestly, I, I don't think I'm right for your job. I said, I took the minimum English requirements in college. I'm a really bad speller, and I have a tendency to fall asleep when I read. And that's, that's how the interview went, seriously. And he, he, he laughed like that and said, okay, because I was only there because I didn't want to be rude to my friend who gave them my name. He said, well, I'll tell her that it's just not going to work out. And uh, so, But he called me about a half hour later and said, I decided to do some investigation here and found out that we are so far behind on proofreading. I've got to hire just a warm body. He said, I, I don't, I, I, know, I realize you don't want the job, you're not that skilled and whatever, but... I need a proofreader. So, and he says, technically, you've applied for the job. Otherwise, I got to go for through a long process. He says, uh, I'll pay you like three times minimum wage if you could give us three hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I can do anything for three hours a day for that much money. And uh, so I took the job and loved it right away. To my own, to my surprise, I I loved it. What sounded like a dreadfully boring task to me became really fun. Um, and I, it's partly because I'm critical, I suppose, because people had always said, you know, you're negative, you're a fault finder, you're glass half empty kind of guy. And now this company's paying me money to find other people's mistakes. <laughs> so it was an ideal job for me. And, and I did have literary skills. I mean, I'd always wanted to be a, a writer. So it worked well and so well, in fact, and Moody Press liked my work that uh, they hired me at the end of that summer to be an editor. And so mm -hmm. I signed on there as an editor. That's how I ended up in Chicago. Okay. And then from there, did you move to California? or From there, I got married. Darlene oh. came to work at Moody Press a okay. year after I started there. I met her on the day she arrived and, and fell in love instantly. 
and uh, and we got married a year later. Okay. And in the interim, I heard John MacArthur for the first time. He came he came to speak at Moody when I was just beginning to date Darlene. I remember I remember the incident because I'd never heard of him. I had no clue who this guy was. And Moody has a speaker come in every every fall for what they call Spiritual Emphasis Week. And he does student chapel every day of the week. They extend student chapel from what's normally a half hour Mm. to a full hour. And so John was giving five full sermons that week. Uh, But I'd never heard of him. And because because it's a special week, employees were invited to student chapel for that week only. And they sent around a flyer to all the employees, and and I got one. and, And I looked at it, and it's... Nah, I don't want to go to that, you know. And and I shared an office with another guy. And the morning it began, he says to me, uh, "Are you going to get down to student chapel?" And I said, "No, nah, I don't think I've ever even heard who that guy is." And so he reads it to me. He says, "This is John MacArthur Jr. He's the pastor of Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California. Uh, he's a fifth generation preacher, and today he's preaching on God's will for your life." And I said, "No, you see there." I, I don't have time to go hear somebody whose claim to fame is he's somebody's son talk about God's will for your life. Somebody should tell Junior that every preacher who comes to <laughs> every preacher who comes to Moody Bible Institute talks about God's will for your life. Yeah. So uh, he said, he said, yeah, you really are a glass half empty kind of guy. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm going to go down there. And so he left. And about 20 seconds later, Darlene stuck her head in the door. And said, I'm going down to Student Chapel. Were you going to come? And I said, yeah, I was just on my way. <laughs> uh, so <yes> no. <laughs> I owe it to her that I heard John for the first time. I remember going down there. And we sat in the balcony behind the sound booth just mm-hmm. because I was only half interested in the speaker. I wanted to sit with Darlene. And, but from the time John started to speak, I was transfixed on what he was saying. I I had never heard anybody preach with that kind of clarity and power, and and it wasn't just stuff I'd heard before. It was all fresh and different, and yet so biblical. He went through every text uh, that talks about God's will and tied them all together in a way. Well, it, it, that message is actually part of his book, God's Will is Not Lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was the first time I ever heard him preach. That was the message he gave. And uh, 10 minutes in, I was thinking... He, that's such rich material. He should be writing books. I don't know why I've never heard of this guy, but he needs an editor. Uh, that was my first thought. And then Darlene and I got married the following summer, and uh, w- I lived two blocks from Wrigley Field in inner city Chicago, and we thought, this, this is a fun place to live, but wouldn't be a great place to raise a family. Mm. And I could do m- book editing anywhere in the world, right? So... Let's go somewhere where we know there's a church that is sound and all that. And I had a friend who uh, is now a pastor of a church in, in the Tampa Bay area, Clearwater, Florida. At the time, he was just on staff there, and that church had two pastors, both of whom were really good expositors. And one preached in the morning, the other in the evening. And he was my best friend. He still is. Uh, Steve Kreloff is his name. And I said, let's, let's move to Florida. We can go to the same church as Kreloff and and uh, be edified, and I can still work for Moody Press from there. And, and so we moved to Florida and had lived there just two months or so, and, and then another friend of mine who was in that area down in St. Petersburg said, he was an assistant pastor and youth pastor in a church there, he called me and said he was leaving that post to, take, uh, the, to be head of a Christian camp in the area, mm-hmm. and they needed a, another assistant pastor, and he wondered, could he submit in my name? And I said, okay. So I spent three years as an assistant pastor in Florida. And when we moved there, when we first moved to Florida, the week we moved there, Grace to You premiered on the radio in three cities. One was Tulsa, my hometown. So it was like the Lord was making sure I heard it. And (laughs) one was Baltimore, which I have no connection to. And then the third one was Tampa. And uh, and so um, Kreloff was a big follower of of John MacArthur. And he said to me, you know, John MacArthur's starting a radio broadcast. And he gave me the time and where to tune in. And so for the three years I was in Florida, I planned every day around Grace to You, listen, so I could listen to John. And I'm teaching young people and 
and benefiting from listening to John, and he was teaching through First John on the radio. I was teaching First John to my my students, and um, it brought up a conflict on the lordship issue. You know, because First John is all about how do you know you're saved, and uh, so I'm teaching through that, and my students one at, one at a time were being convicted that they weren't really saved and coming to faith in Christ. And to my surprise, their parents weren't happy about it. They were like, no, no, my, my little boy accepted Jesus when he was two years old. He sat on my lap and asked Jesus into his heart, and you're making him think he's not saved. And I said, it's, it's by faith we're saved. And uh, I, I said, I, just watch him and see if there's a change in his life. And, and so it kind of worked itself out, but I had this conflict Mm-hmm. Uh, at times over lordship salvation and so i thought you know john macarthur ought to write a book on that after i'd been in florida for three years i got a phone call out of the blue one day from jerry jenkins he's the guy who wrote left behind and all of that he was the boss at moody press during those years and okay. he said and and they had been offering me positions ever since i moved away uh and he said look we keep offering you jobs and i know you say no he said but i think i have something that might interest you now he says we're about to start a project, that, project that's the biggest project we've ever done. Uh, it's, it's a 10-year project to go through the entire New Testament and make commentaries with John MacArthur's material. And I'm like, 10 years? Because huh? I was listening to John <laughs> and thinking, he's not going to get through the whole New Testament in 10 years at his pace. <laughs> and in the end, the series took 30, more than 30 years. Yeah. But uh, it was that project that first brought me together with John, and Jerry said, look, fly up to Chicago on such and such a date. It was a day in August of 1981, and he said, we're going to have a meeting here at Moody Press with John MacArthur. I said, you mean I'll get to meet him? And he says, yeah. And I'm like, I'm there. So I flew up there, and we had this meeting about the commentary series, and uh, afterwards, while everybody's kind of milling around talking, and I sidled over to John and said, you know, I listen to you every day on the radio, and you need to do a book on the lordship I- issue. That was those are my first words ever to him. And uh, on your first meeting with yeah, him. first time I met him, I <laughs> listen to you write a book <laughs> every day on the radio, and you need to do a book on the lordship issue. And he said, you know, I want to. He said, I even have a title in mind: the gospel according to Jesus. And um, he also knew that uh, I, I was there. While I was there to talk about the commentary series, uh, Jerry wanted me to interview for a position they had open mm-hmm. as acquisitions editor. The, so, so my job would be to find manuscripts in the works and acquire them for Moody Press. And uh, John was on the board at Moody Bible Institute at the time, so he knew that Moody was trying to hire me. And he, he said, look, I know Moody wants you as their acquisitions editor. If they hire you in that position, call me. Because he said, you're the first person in Christian publishing that has ever expressed an interest in a book like that, and I really want to do it. So I took the job as acquisitions editor, moved back to Chicago in 1981, and my first day on the job, I wrote a contract for the Gospel According to Jesus. And I spent the next year uh, working with John on his book, Worship, The Ultimate Priority, and he apparently liked my work, and uh, when I finished that book, I was driving him somewhere one day. He'd barely got in the car. We went one stoplight, and he looks over at me and says, you know, you should quit your job and come to work for me. And I said, okay. <laughs> and and wow. I've been here ever since. So that's, the, that's how I ended up in California. Okay, so then how... Tell me about that transition then. And starting at Grace to You, what do you start doing? Yeah, um... The, the opening at Grace to You at the time was supposed to be a temporary thing. John wanted, he wanted me here to, to help with his writing. And um, he, he loved the work I did on The Ultimate Priority, and he had other books in mind, but he was also interested in the, the Lordship book. So he brought me here for that, uh, because he, wanted, he really wanted to do these, these books. But the only opening for me to be on staff was at Grace to You, uh, answering questions that came in from listeners. Mm. So I spent the first year doing that. And at the time, Grace to You was actually a department of Grace Church. We were part of the same organization. And 
so was the tape ministry. So the radio ministry and tape ministry were in actually two different buildings okay. with two different staffs and all of that. And after I'd been here a year, I raised the question, look, the, the budget of our media ministry is more than a million dollars, more than $4 million a year. And uh, we, get, we get like 10 minutes on the elders' agenda every month. I think the media ministry needs to spin off and become its own entity with a board that holds them accountable. Uh, this is not exactly how it happened, but yeah. to shorten the story, John basically said, yeah, let's do that, and he put me in charge. So uh -huh. um, I accidentally sort of backed into the role of executive director at Grace to You, and I don't think John or, any, or I or anyone thought that that would become permanent, but... It did, and now 40 years later, I'm still here and still in that role. Okay, so being executive director, right? What did that entail for you? What were you responsible for? And again, so you said that Grace to You used to be in the same building as Grace Community Church? No, or, or? no, it used to be a department of the church, a but a we, were, we were housed in a separate building about a half mile away, Okay. and the tape ministry was also in another building, also a half mile away, Okay. And and John wanted me to combine those two in one, so we rented another facility out by the Glendale Burbank Airport, oh, okay. and combined the two ministries in one, and s started it as a independent ministry with 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 a board that was made up of elders at Grace Church. We've always had uh, the the partnership and accountability to the church. To this day, you can't be an employee at Grace to you if you don't attend grace if you're not a member of grace church yeah we have we have elders still on our board although we also have other people on the board now but the original board was just a group of four elders okay so tell me then uh what does that look like for you being the executive director and then also how do you end up then hosting like oh. those opening sessions for all, all of these things happen by accident you know it uh <laughs> I guess God's providence. Yeah. <laughs> Just bringing you there. <laughs> I'll answer the first question yeah. first. Yeah. The second question first. Because our, our announcer for years was Carl Miller. He was, I think, for 32 years the announcer at Grace to You. Right. But he lived in Oklahoma. Here, here's an ironic thing. He went to college about a half mile from the house I lived in when I was saved. What? And, uh, and his home was Oklahoma. By then he was in Edmond, Oklahoma, which okay. is where my grandmother lived. Uh, so he and I have very common roots and some mutual friends from high school era. Uh, so I always like Carl and all of that, but he, um, he retired. He, he'd done it for 32 years and he, he does other announcing. And so he retired as our announcer and the agency we work with said, you really need someone who can be in the studio with John and, you know, interview him. And I said, you know, we don't really have anybody who has a radio voice, who knows John that well. And, and they said, y you do it. And I'm like, mm, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> But anyway, I backed into that role. And uh, to, me, to me, even now, I turn on the radio broadcast and hear my own voice, and it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. I, I, <laughs> I can't stand it. But we do get a lot yeah. of good feedback because yeah. it's a little more personal. I can interact with John, whereas... Carl was was he would record a, a script that was written for him mm. uh, from Oklahoma, and it would always end with a question that he throws to John, and then John would answer the question. Yeah. And to someone who's not really intently paying attention, it sounded like they were in the same room, but there was no interaction. There was never any follow-up from Carl or whatever. He'd throw the question to John, and John would take over and say his thing, and then it would go back to Carl, and he'd give the address. And So having me in the studio gives an opportunity for me. John's not easy to interrupt, but I'll do it every now and then <laughs> and ask him a follow-up question or add yeah. something to what he's saying. And, yeah. and so uh, the feedback's been good. People say it sounds good. It, it, it gives, I, because I can ask John and often do ask questions that are totally unscripted. I just ask him what I want to know. Mm -hmm. And so I think it sounds more natural. Yeah. I, I have to say, though, it was never any aspiration of mine to become a radio <laughs> announcer. Really? Because your no. voice, honestly, is like perfect for the radio. It's yeah. like a voice, you know, like that you would expect to listen on, on the radio. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So tell me then now, uh, oh, before that, before I ask the question again, but how long have you been doing the radio, uh, hosting for Grace to You? Boy, I, 
I, I can't remember. I would have said, it doesn't seem like that long, but I imagine it's four or five years now. Really? Yeah. Okay. And so, but then your position as executive director has been for that, 40... Yeah, about 38 years. 38 I've been years. at Grace T for 40 years Okay. and became executive director a little, little more than a year after I came. Okay, so what does that mean to be executive director? Like, what are some of your responsibilities? Well, it means I answer directly to John and the board, and so I'm responsible for everything that happens. But what it means in practice is I have to find people who know what they're doing more than I do, and... Let them do. Let them do the work. Uh, yeah. That's what makes it easy. It really is an easy job for me because I just find people who know better than I do what to do and turn them loose to do it, yeah. and they do it well. And uh, in fact, the longevity on our management team at Grace to You is really quite remarkable. Most of our guys have been there longer than fifteen years, and they're all in a position where they're not vying for someone else's position. Mm -hmm. They're each doing what they're most gifted and and interested in doing, and mm -hmm. it's a great place to work. It really is. Uh, I, I think we probably have the highest staff morale of any place I've ever worked. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting because when we did the teaser, we went to Grace to you to film with you uh, for that teaser, and it was my first time. I think. Yeah, it was my first time at, at Grace to You. So we have some friends who work with you guys like Daryl, uh, yeah. Harrison, and Young uh, Leon. Yeah. So he's a dear friend of, uh, of ours. Uh, he's been such a great help for us with the um, uh, sound and Sojourners because we were both part of uh, Sojourners Fellowship Group. And so Young has been a, a, an amazing blessing to me and to Richard as we serve Sojourners. And when I went to Grace to You, he was the one who gave me a tour of like, oh, you good. know, the whole He's a good group. man. Yeah, he's so I've known Young yeah. since he was a kid. Actually. Really? Yeah, well, I've been at Grace for 40 years. He can't be much older than 45, right? I don't know. And his mom was. I've never asked him this age. I don't think he will give him. I don't think he will answer that question for me. <laughs> his mom was friends with with okay. my wife, so I've um, known him since he was little. Yeah, and I mean, because a lot of the people, obviously, you know, like they go to Grace. Is like I I went there and I'm like, oh, Christy Rose is here. She's my friend yeah, too. So yeah. it's like I I saw so many faces that I recognize, and it was just so amazing. But uh, okay, so. Uh, we cover now uh, how long you've been working, then at Grace to You and all of that. So how do you then, because you also serve as an elder at Grace Community Church, so how do you become an elder at Grace? When do you become an elder? And then also, how do you become the pastor of uh, Grace Life? Yeah. You can take uh, the first question. <laughs> again, it, it was kind of all accidental. Uh, mm -hmm. When, when uh, John promoted me to be executive director at Grace to You, uh, at about the same time, they made me an elder. And there were other elders at the time who told me, candidly, they thought I was too young to be an elder. And I kind of agreed. I How mean, old are the, you? I, at the time, I was about 29 or 30. Wow. Uh, so I would have been just 30, if, if that. Okay. Uh, and I remember feeling like, I'm not old enough and wise enough to sit with these men and sound off. And so uh, I think I was fairly quiet for the first few years, but it was a great learning experience watching mm -hmm. the elders at Grace Church do business. And uh, not sure why they made me an elder, but I suspect it's because I was the first kid on my block to have a portable computer, uh, a, a, a personal computer. Yeah. And and early in my career at Grace U, I got a portable one so I could carry it around. And I would go to the elders meeting, and I was the secretary who took the minutes. And so I think it was the convenience of having this kid who could take minutes <laughs> that actually got me on the elder board. And, and uh, this is another interesting fact. I was at Grace Church for 11 years before I ever taught adults in a, in a group larger than my own living room Bible study. Uh, so I, wasn't, I didn't aspire to be a pastor or a preacher or, or uh you know, regularly teach, much less fill the pulpit when John's gone at Grace. I never imagined myself doing that. And to this day, it kind of makes my head spin that he would, he would turn his pulpit over to me. I'm not sure I would do that. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so after I'd been here 11 years, I was teaching Sunday school in the junior boys division. So, okay. like, kids not even in junior high yet. One of the pastors on staff at the time was Lance Quinn. He was the executive 
assistant to John. He was like the, the guy who really ran the office day to day. And he founded Grace Life, the fellowship group that I'm now a pastor of. Okay. He started this new fellowship group because uh, he wanted a fellow, an adult fellowship group that focused on mostly teaching. He wanted to teach doctrine. And, and this may surprise you because Grace Church isn't like this anymore, but in those days, most of the adult Sunday school classes were kind of thin on teaching and more on fellowship. They like to sit around tables and talk mm-hmm. about, you know, what 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 this means. And it was more discussion and not just one guy up there teaching because the rationale was, look, we have John preaching to us. We don't need another sermon. Mm. But Grace Life grew quickly because there were people hungry for even I mean, good biblical teaching foments an appetite for more. Mm-hmm. And so people wanted more teaching and uh, so Grace Life grew, and uh, over the years, most of the other adult fellowship groups have begun to focus more on teaching than anything else. Yeah. But um, Lance brought me in to teach a couple of series. He said, yeah, you need to be teaching adults. You're teaching boys. It's a waste of your gifts. And, <laughs> and I said, yeah, I don't really aspire to do what you do. And he said, well, I want you to do the, you know, this series. And I think the first thing he assigned me was on the plagues of Moses, uh, and it was one message, so I went through the ten plagues in one sermon. And uh, I didn't think it went particularly well, but he had me back and had me back. And then when he left Grace Church, he became a pastor in Arkansas for several years. Uh, when he left Grace Church, he asked me to take over Grace Life and teach in there regularly. Mm. And so that's what I did. I think I started doing that around 1993 or 1994. So, serving so in Grace Life. In Grace Life. Oh, so, so that's good, about almost 30 years. Yeah. Uh, 1990? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's been a while. And then you're still there. And so now you're serving along with Mike Mike Curry. Riccardi, yeah. Yeah, both of you. Yeah. He's, he's, Mike is the probably the smartest seminary student I ever met. And when he came to Grace Church, he looked to me like a high school kid. Uh, it kind of still does. <laughs> he, he's, he looks young. But he's, yeah. <laughs> he's so smart. Yeah. Uh, yeah. People ask me, you know, who do you, who do you go to when you have a doctrinal question? Mike Riccardi. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, we do these Q&As every now and then, and I always say, you know... In Grace Life? Yeah. Okay. Like, we do it we do, do it twice a year, once the first Sunday of the year and once the last Sunday before July. Okay. Uh, and um, I can depend on him to filibuster... Uh, if there's a hard question I don't know the answer to, I just point to him, and he will answer it so long. He'll have such a thorough answer that by the time he's done, I'm like, yeah, I agree with him. Yeah. That's all Whatever I have to say. <laughs> Whatever he says. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, <clears throat> Sojourners is an a Old Testament right. fellowship group. So what? How, how would you describe Grace Life? Do you guys have like a main focus through the Bible or you no. just go through all of it? Yeah, no, we're just a hodgepodge, really. I I don't do many series because uh, because there are two of us there and we trade off. I'll I'll teach for two weeks in a row and okay. he'll teach the next two weeks. That's generally how the pattern is supposed to work because of travel and everything. Sometimes I'll teach three weeks and then he's on one and then I'm back one and then he does two or whatever. Okay. But it's there's no pattern to it. And because there's sometimes two or three weeks between my opportunities to preach, yeah. I don't want to leave people hanging and then come back four weeks later and say, we'll pick up where we left off, <laughs> you know. So I try to make each message stand alone, which okay. means I do probably more, well, I, I don't really do topical messages. I do occasionally. I'll take up a doctrine or mm-hmm. a subject and do it. But I try to choose bite-sized passages of Scripture okay. uh, and... And just do a sermon on this paragraph, and it doesn't necessarily have any connection to what I'll do two weeks from now. Um, and so I know that's not the approved method, but that is what we do in Grace Life, okay. and it tends to be weighted towards theology, mm-hmm. uh, and not you know we don't we don't deal with how to be a good husband or you know anything uh, the. The sheerly practical stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, my tendency, I think, is to pick Bible verses that, on the face of it, can be confusing, mm-hmm. and try to untangle what does this really mean. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I do that as much for my benefit as anyone else. Yeah. 
So I actually forgot to ask, but how long, when you were talking about your wife, I just let you go because you kind of just moved smoothly there. But I wanted to ask you, so how long have you guys been married? You yes, and Darlene. Yeah, this Darlene, year, right? Yeah, Darlene. This year, June 10th, will be our 45th anniversary. Wow. She's put up with me for 45 years. She deserves a medal for that. <laughs> and I, I remember it exactly. I mean, I, I can't forget the date because my birthday is June 11th. So we got married the day before. I told her she's the best birthday present <laughs> I ever got. But, uh, but I don't always remember the year. You know, when somebody says, how long have you been married? I'm like, in between those, you know, landmark dates, like mm -hmm. the 45th and the 40th and the 30th, like if it's 42, 43, I can't always remember. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, I'll typically say, we've been married more than 40 years, and that drives her crazy. It just, so it's kind of become a joke between us, you know. <laughs> so when somebody says, and she's there, if she was yeah. here, and you said, how long have you been married? I would have said, more than 40 years. <laughs> and she would throw something at me, because we have, we have sons who are older than 40 now. Yeah. So, but no, 45 years. Okay. And how many kids do you guys have? Three. We had three sons, all boys. Okay. My eldest works at Grace to You. He's, he does a lot of what I used to do. He edits John MacArthur's material, and uh, he's our editorial department mm -hmm. director. My middle son is a CPA and tax accountant. Uh, he's partners with Chris Hamilton, who's the chairman yeah. of the Board yeah. of Elders at Grace. Yeah. And um, my youngest son is a policeman with the LAPD. And they all live within... Um, well, within 20 minutes of us. A couple mm. of them live almost within walking distance. Mm. Uh, and they all still go to Grace Church. And we have seven grandkids wow. who also all go to Grace Church. So Sundays for us are uh, every week a family reunion. That's amazing. It's so nice. You get to have your, your family. It's nice. I used to think that when I got to be 65, I'd probably <laughs> have to retire. And then I would move back to Oklahoma and maybe pastor a small church. Mm. But... With grandkids in California, no way I'm leaving. <laughs> yeah, why? Did you yeah. have them close and get to spend time with them here? Yeah, that's and right. And plus everything that you're still doing, because you're still like, grace to you, that's and true. you're an elder Until and they kick me out, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like, you don't have a reason to leave. That's right. <laughs> all the reasons are here, right? Um, all right, so I think we can move on to our signature questions for the podcast. You love writing, and I'm guessing you also lo love reading books, so do you have any favorite books? You know, I don't read anything but nonfiction. I, the last fiction book I read was probably 15 years ago. I just don't read fiction. Uh, so I read a lot of theology, mm -hmm. and um, I also like true crime books. I don't know why, but... <laughs> Andrea loves true crime books, yeah. which you guys were talking about <laughs> yeah, before that's right. we started recording. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, but true, you know, true books. I, I just don't need to waste my time on fiction. Yeah. Now, that'll offend a whole lot of people. <laughs> and I don't mean to be offensive, but I just, you know, if I want fiction, yeah. and sometimes I do, but it's easier just to switch everything off and watch a movie mm -hmm. uh, for fiction. But... If I'm going to read and, and really apply my mind to understanding, you know, words on a page, I'd rather have it something that edifies me with facts and truth. And mm -hmm. From the top of your head, do you have any, like, names of, like, favorite books? I don't know. I like to just, like, give some of to my listeners some resources. And a lot of the people, they start buying those books when people mention it. If you don't, that's totally fine, too. You know, favorite books for me ch probably changes every year, depending on mm. what I've read. Okay. Uh, I like Puritan works. I like Thomas Watson is probably my favorite Puritan author. Mm. Uh, uh, people go wild over John Owen. I find him tedious, uh, but I'll read it. My very favorite all-time books would be pretty much anything with Spurgeon sermons. Mm. Uh, and if I had to narrow it down to just one volume... There is a small paperback collection of things Spurgeon wrote and said during the downgrade controversy uh, that was published by Pilgrim, uh, Pil Pilgrim Publications from Texas. They were the ones that reprinted all of Spurgeon's sermons, mm -hmm. and they compiled this little volume of all of the sermons and um, magazine articles that Spurgeon wrote okay. during the downgrade controversy. That book probably has done more to shape my my views of uh, 
you know, what we need to be wary of in the church today, because Mm -hmm. one of the points Spurgeon was making in the downgrade was that the cycle of apostasy is repeatable and predictable. It happens the same every time, Mm -hmm. and it's a cycle that repeats on a regular basis in the church, uh, and we need to watch out for it. And I learned so much from that. Uh, Was I think if I hadn't read that book, uh, I my my antenna might not have gone up to see the danger of the emerging church movement at the beginning mm-hmm. of the new millennium. Uh, mm-hmm. But that was what motivated me to start my blog because I wanted to critique the emerging church movement. I, I thought, this is dangerous, and everybody's talking about it like it's the greatest, latest thing. Mm-hmm. Somebody needs to point out the problems with it. And so I, I wrote my blog mainly to do just that. So you have a blog page then? Yeah, I quit writing the blog around 2012, but everything is still there. Oh, okay. If you Google it, it's called Pyromaniacs. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I wrote it with, uh, it was originally Pyromaniac because I was the only writer. And I realized that writing a daily blog was more than I could do with all my duties. And so I recruited a couple of other guys to write with me and we would take turns okay. writing. Uh, and wrote for, I don't, I don't know how long, it was close to a decade Okay. Uh, and I keep pointing people back to it because some of the same things that we critiqued in 2005 and 2006 are the very issues that have arisen again with woke theology mm-hmm. and wokeness. And I, I keep realizing a lot of people who are, who are gung, gung-ho on wokeism in the church today are young people who weren't even alive during the emerging church movement, and they don't, they don't remember that, much less... Have they learned anything from it? And it underscores why Spurgeon w- was so uh, eager to point out that these cycles repeat, and we need to learn from history, but we don't. Yeah, we keep doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually will make sure to add the link here. I'll probably message you to get that from you and make sure that everyone can find it there if they okay. want to check it out. Yeah. Uh, so three things that bring you joy. Three things... That bring you joy. My wife, my grandchildren, and my children in that order. Wow. Huh? This was the easiest one. Everyone <laughs> always struggles. Like, only three? <laughs> that was easy. Yeah, no. Wife, grandkids, and yeah. your kids. <laughs> grandkids are the, are the Scripture says, the crown of old age. They are, I think, the, the greatest blessing you know, God can give old people. It's the one thing that makes getting old worth it. Mm. Right, so I love my grandkids, and my kids tell me it's like you love the grandkids more than you loved us, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that t- tends to happen. Do yeah. <laughs> Do you spoil them because that's a, of how I remember? That's right? the great thing about being a grandfather. You can <laughs> you can give them everything they ask for until they need to be told no. Because they do need to be told no, but yeah. when that happens, then you turn them over to your parents. You just say, well, go ask your mom. <laughs> and she tells them no, so I never have to. <laughs> That's true. So because you just want them to like you. That's right. Time. And they do. They love me. <laughs> you give them all the sugar and then the parents have to deal with that, right? <laughs> you just that happens it. occasionally, too. Uh- <laughs> all right, uh, Phil. So this podcast, our main goal is to, um, obviously, to show the transformation of everyone's life, you know, through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are dead in our sins and we can do nothing to give ourselves life, right? Like you can't raise a dead dead person. So why is it that we all need Jesus Christ? Because we are dead in trespasses and sins. And the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And, um, you know, we can't, there's nothing we can do to make ourselves acceptable to him. And yet, uh, what awaits us is merely the wrath of God unless we are redeemed. We need a Savior, mm-hmm. but we can't save ourselves. And, and that's really the first thing the gospel aspires to teach people. When Paul talks about the gospel in Romans, he says, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. And so you think, now he's launch into the gospel. This is going to be gospel is good news, right? So this is going to be good news. His next words, the very next verse... For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And then he goes on for three solid chapters, convincing us that no matter who you are, Jew, Gentile, moral Gentile, immoral Gentile, whoever you are, you are 
a hopeless sinner, and you cannot redeem yourself. And and it's not until the end of chapter 3 that he gets to the fact of redemption, the fact that we can be saved because we have a Savior, not because we can save ourselves. And I think until you realize that, that I, I can't help myself, I need a Savior, then you know, well, Jesus, in fact, said it's, it's not the well people who need a physician, but those who are sick. And what he meant was until you realize how sick you are, mm-hmm. no physician could possibly help you. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so we need a Savior, and that's true of all of us. Yeah. Amen. Well, Phil, it has been my joy to have you here on the podcast and to get to know you as well, right? I love getting to know the people that I go to church with, you know, right, and our yeah. elders and... Yeah, thank you so much for your faithfulness and for everything that you continue to do all these years, you know, to serve the Lord and His people. So we're very grateful for everything that you do. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And friends, uh, before we go, uh, if you guys want to find the resources that we've mentioned here, uh, his blog page, just uh, check the description here. Or if you want to find find us, like I mentioned in the beginning, in our social media, all the links will be here on the description. And before we go, will you mind just closing us in prayer? Sure. Yeah. Lord, thanks for this time that we can meet and talk and share the truth of the gospel. We pray, Lord, that uh, those who listen would be convicted of their need for a Savior. We thank you that you've given a Savior in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that uh, everything we have said here would glorify him. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen.